Is your family tree a mystery? Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip, hip, hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In cut-off genes. <laughs> Welcome to Cut-Off Genes, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon-Jackson, and I am a genetic genealogist henceforth known as a Gen Genie. And I am Richard Castle, the producer and co-host of the podcast. How's it going, Julie? It's going fine. How's it going with you, my friend? Good, you know, because I got my second shot. I know that you got your second on the same day as I did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've got those antibodies flowing through our veins as we speak. (laughs) So I want to hear about your experience first. You know, I had a pretty (laughs) good time of it, I have to say. I, um, I drank tons of water. Like, I just kept drinking water all day long. And I just, you know, my arm was sore and I felt a little achy that night, like in bed, like my the, my back ached a little and I was super mm-hmm. tired and kind of foggy. But I didn't, yes. I did not feel like I had the flu. I didn't feel sick. I just oh, felt okay. like out of it, like really out of it. Like I'm glad I didn't have to take a test yes. or do anything important. But right. I think I got off rather easier because I spoke to other people who were sick for days, you know. You said something about the woman who gave you the shot. Oh, yeah. So, I, so I'm, I'm sitting there rolling up my sleeve and I said to the woman, so what can I take, you know, if I start to feel sick or whatever? She said, oh, just take some Tylenol. And I said, what, you know, what um, side effects did you have? And she goes, oh, I didn't have it. And I said, oh, you didn't have any sound, side effects? She goes, no, I haven't taken the shot. And I said, well, but you're a nurse. I didn't want to argue with her because she was about to jab me with something sharp, but I yes. was I was a little mortified that the healthcare I worker... I would have had to know. Yeah. Right? I would have been like, what? It's okay to give it to me, but you don't want it. <laughs> yeah, that's very strange. I would think that they would have to have it unless, unless she has some kind of a... Um, allergies to ingredients in it. Or I something. didn't get that that was the reason. She just, you know, I, I don't know. Hmm. That's, that's fascinating. I wonder if that's who I had. <laughs> Cause you know, we go to the same place. You know, they say, well, oh, it's a personal choice and it is when it comes down to it. it it's your, it it's your body. But I mean, I also feel like it's being a good citizen because you're helping prevent infection around you, not just for you. Yeah. And I feel like I feel like anti-vaxxers are the ones that are like, yeah, enough people will do it. They'll protect me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <You know? laughs> although there are some that, I mean, have genuine, like their fears or whatever, uh, whether they're founded or not, they have them. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I, I totally am, support the vaccine effort. I'm glad to have done it. I would have done it if I'd known I was going to have the flu for three days because that yeah. is still better than the alternative. Yes. And guess, and get this, um, I'm going back to work. It's it's a definite thing. So I'm going back to Yay! play piano, and um, they actually called me the night before my last shot and asked oh, me to come so back good. in. And I said I will come back in two weeks after, two weeks from tomorrow. I said <laughs> after That's I'm fully so vaccinated. Great. Yes. Uh, what a relief. Yeah, and you know, I mean, honestly, <gasps> it's it's funny because I know I'm protected. Um, by uh-huh. the vaccine, but I'm still mm-hmm. a little um, anxious about it. I'm going to do it and I'm excited to do it, but I'm a little anxious in that hmm. I'm going to be in a room full of people without masks. I'll be wearing one, but yeah. uh, you know, because they'll be eating and I'll be playing piano. And it's just an odd <laughs> feeling when you haven't been around anybody for a year, really. Yeah. Yeah. So I um, think it is for everybody. I mean, I've got, we've, my whole family uh, went out together <laughs> the other night. Mm-hmm. And it was the first time. But my husband and I have gone out a little bit. Yes, for your anniversary um, and his birthday. Yes, for anniversary. Yes, and and my birthday. Uh, your birthday. But, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, but my kids have not. All right. And they are super super cautious. And it was really Beckett was kind of like the last the last one to finally go. That's interesting because I it, I always tend to see a lot of younger people around. You know, acting as if there's no pandemic at all. <laughs> Oh, not my kids. Yeah. No, no. You put the fear all. of Jesus into them. Huh? They're just, you know what? They read. Yeah. <laughs> they pay attention. <laughs> they believe in science. I don't know. <laughs> Call me crazy. Where did you go wrong, Julie? <laughs> I don't know. How dare I? But I'm I'm glad that you and I are both um, on the same schedule as far as vaccinations, because that means I get to hug yes. you again next time I see you, and I can't yes. wait to do that. Yeah, me too. But enough about Vax Talk. Vax Talk. <laughs> Welcome back to Vax Talk, everybody. Let's talk about some DNA news. Um, all right. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so somebody, a new listener, actually, Larissa Jane, drew my attention to uh, an announcement. Do you remember the case of the boy in the box? Refresh my memory. So, because I remember the boy in the bubble. I know it sounds familiar. <laughs> yes, John Travolta yes. in a plastic bubble. Um, no, there in 1957. Um, In Philadelphia, uh, a six-year-old, I guess approximate six-year-old boy's body was found in a cardboard box um, in the fox chase section of the city. Um, And let me see. Oh, and he's now buried at Ivy Hill Cemetery in the outskirts of Northwest Philadelphia. He has like this whole shrine there as the boy in the box. Really? So, um, yeah. But it's never been solved. Um, his, uh, his remains were battered like he looked like he'd been killed with blunt force trauma. Yes. And, um, but he was clean and looked like he had a fresh haircut. And did anyone ever claim him? So they don't have a name or anything. Nobody ever claimed him. Which, which leads you to believe that perhaps it was a a parent that did it. Right. Because. Right. And there are, there are theories. Speaking of theories, um, (laughs) About it, like there have been um, in many of the there. I, I read a few articles about it, and there's there have been theories, but nothing has ever been enough to actually look into anybody, and nothing ever came uh, to fruition. Okay. Um. Apparently, um. There was like some some woman who goes by Mary that said that it was her brother or something, or her adopted brother, and her mother had drowned him in the bathtub. Mm. And she said this years later and obviously was followed up on and nothing happened. So, so did they know, go back it, and do it, uh, take DNA samples from the body? So what they did was two years ago, um, they had to exhume the remains. Right. And they were able to retrieve his DNA. His, uh, this time they were able to retrieve his DNA and sent to a lab in Europe for some reason. Um, and now they have a profile. Wow. It's amazing yeah. that the DNA, that they can extract DNA from someone who's been dead. You said this was 1957? Yeah, it's wow. been 60-some years. Well, I guess, yeah. you know, if they can go back to these buried kings and mummies and things like that and try to get DNA from them, 57 yeah. is just I mean, like yesterday. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think it depends on the um, the condition of the body. Yes. But, yeah, the, I mean, they can. I, I, I obviously don't know what it takes to build an autosomal um, profile, right, right. which is well, how we find family. Mm-hmm. But that is the goal, obviously. And there is no, it's all very hush-hush. But uh, I've heard through the grapevine that it's been given to Barbara Ray Venter, who was the gen genie that uh, broke the Golden State Killer case. Mm. Um, apparently, uh, the DNA Doe project doesn't, doesn't do children, which is strange. I don't know why they wouldn't. Hmm. But word is, word on the street is, um, <laughs> <laughs> that Barbara Ray Venter has it. So What is that, Gen Genie Boulevard? <laughs> word on Gen Genie Boulevard is. <laughs> word on Gigi Lane. <laughs> so, yeah, so that is, that's something that just just happened. People are constantly, um, there. the DNA Doe Project has a Facebook page, and there is not a day goes by that somebody new to the page doesn't say, hey, has anybody thought about trying to solve the John Bonet Ramsey case this, this way? <laughs> and people lose their minds oh. because, <laughs> because it's been talked about ad nauseum. Right. And it, you know, obviously... If it could be done, it it would have been done by now. So this boy um, in the box, they are yeah. literally just trying to find out who he was and not necessarily, I mean, it'd be nice, I guess it would be a nice bonus to find out how he was killed and who killed him, but this is not a crime scene. This right. is more like, who is it in that grave? Well, and also, I mean, they could, I mean, what they will do is find out who his parents were right. and, you know, take yeah. it from there. There are rumors, once again, these are all rumors that he was possibly trafficked um, and sold to a family, and then they had their own child. And there was also, like, rumors that possibly he uh, had an intellectual disability and was killed because of it. 
and uh, he wasn't of that family. Right. Um, but you figure yeah, like I don't so, know. somebody had to have been looking for their kid. And there, I'm sure there were a lot of parents around the country. It who, was a national story. Right, right. I mean, But who have yeah. kids that were lost that would probably look to say, oh, is that, was that my son? Right. If they had, if, if their child exactly. was missing. I wonder, I, it sounds like maybe he was like a, uh, uh, trafficked from another country. That would be the only thing that really made sense. Yeah, that would be hard to... You know what I mean? And then yeah. in that case, if that was the case, it would be even harder then, right? Because if you were to put yes. it into the database now, is it... Well, it depends on what country. If it was Russia, it would be very difficult. Well, I hope that they can find out you know, who that poor kid was all these I, years I, later. I hope so, too. Um, I'll be watching closely yes. uh, for updates. And I look forward to... To resolve. And thank you to our new listener. Thank you, Larissa. Larissa, for um, yes. for, give, for sending in that uh, article. Okay. So in Ireland, I think, there was a GP general practitioner uh, named Irene Creedon who arranged secret, secret adoptions at her surgery by taking children from vulnerable mothers and allowing adoptive parents to register the children as their own over at least two decades. Oh, dear. Yeah. What is it with these Irish people? What is it with these Irish people and their... <laughs> and their adoption and their, pra- yeah. practices. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Dr. Creighton's family have confirmed that the late GP arranged secret adoptions, but insisted she was a heroine whose only desire was to help others. However, by going in outside state services and allowing couples to falsely register babies, um, she was knowingly breaking the law. A number of people... Uh, adopted in this way are outraged that they now have no way of discovering who their birth parents are. Well, they do have DNA, but <laughs> it's that's not mentioned in this article at all. So, right, uh, right. It, it, it does kind of amaze me though that um, people who do these things they can kind of rationalize it to themselves that, like, oh, well, I'm doing it for the, the good of the child or the whatever, the greater good. Well, yeah, but that myth is that myth is long, uh, has long been. Dispelled because I agree, but I still yeah. think that uh, that's the excuse they give, you know, oh, sure, yeah. for basically yeah. committing a crime. Mm-hmm. Why was that horrible doctor that was using his own sperm to inseminate the, his patients? You know, oh, I'm doing it for the for the greater good. They wanted to have Jessica a baby. Jessica Stavina's father. Um, yes. By the way, a little side side note update on that. The court um, I threw out all of his um, rebuttals and all of his filings. And uh, so he took an early retirement. Mm. So that's good. It's too good for him. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it is too good for him that he got away with it. Yeah. Um, but his the his son is taking over his practice oh, for him. Wow. Well. The practice is still in practice. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Um, the extent of Dr. Creedon's illicit adoptions was uncovered by Longford-based mother of two, Margaret Norton, who last year began trying to trace her birth. Uh, mother following the death of her adoptive parents. She discovered that as a baby, she'd been handed to her adoptive mother and far- father in um, a County Louth hotel car park and was registered registered as their biological child. Ugh. Um, the only clue was that her place of birth is registered as 31 O'Neill Street, Carrick Macross, which is Dr. Creedon's surgery or was Dr. Creedon's surgery. Um, after posting her details online and telling an anonymized version of her story on a radio show, she was contacted by a string of others with the same story, many of whom were also registered as being born at that exact same address. Oh, wow. Uh, Ms. McDermott said she was not certain how many adoptions her mother had organized. That's the daughter, Marie McDermott, of the doctor, but praised her mother's efforts to help childless families and single mothers in distress simultaneously. She helped a lot of people. They were, they were, they were different times in a different era. That old chestnut. Uh, People came to her when they needed help, whether it was to give up a child or adopt a child. My mother was a wonderful person, a heroine. She was an extraordinary woman. Well, she was your mother. Um, Asked about the fact that births were registered illegally. She said paperwork wasn't something they were strict about back then. That's changed for the better. I'm kind of doing an Irish lilt. Uh, Some people don't want to be found, but I do understand that people have a right to know who they are. Uh, lots of girls had babies who were hidden or given back, given away back then. It was they did, but that doesn't make it okay to keep it a secret. Right? Um, it's very sad, and people were shamed. Blah blah blah. Mummy helped a lot of those people. I do that quote. Like you said, um, she was she's protecting the memory of her mother. 
Of course. Uh, she rejected suggestion, suggestions that her mother received money for arranging the adoptions, saying the things she did to help people was unreal. She helped people who were elderly and hungry as well as people. So she just went on and just, you know, gave her a glowing review. So Take it to Yelp. <laughs> Don't think her practice is open anymore. Either. Um, so, so the adoptee, the original adoptee, who this story is about, said, "I have absolutely no idea who my birth parents are. There is no way of finding out. Not true. Uh, without them coming forward or passing some me some information, there's no trace of my past. Never doors been closed to my face. Her adopted parents told her from an early age that she was not their biological child. She had very little reason to question the circumstances, having been told she was." born in 1972 and adopted a few days later. Uh, the things my mother did tell me th that I was three days old when she got me and I came with clothes. That's all I know. <laughs> I believe my adoptive mother didn't have a clue about my past or else she was told don't ever repeat this. So she was, she really realized that something was up when she started looking for her birth certificate. Um, when she found it and her adoptive parents were actually listed at her as her ex actual parents sounds like she needs a gen genie's help she does she needs to find the irish equivalent of you julie the julie o'dixon <laughs> yikes <laughs> julie o'dixon jackson <laughs> oh, he's a holy sweating mother of saint patrick okay um anywho that's the gist of that yeah. so this type of thing keeps just uh happening over and over again um and in different, the whole birth certificate thing is, my birth certificate said my parents were my parents too, but it was an abstract of a birth certificate. I don't, you will, in Australia, you don't get your, an original birth certificate. You never have an original birth certificate or you never have one to access until you apply for it as an adoptee. I see. So the birth certificate I had all my life until I got my original was an abstract that just said... I was born on this date in, in this place. Right. And had clearly no personality at all. <laughs> well, you've made up for that in spades. <laughs> I had to, right? All right, we can take a break Let's now. take a break. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. Or consider supporting us on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash cutoff jeans podcast. Now back to Julie and me. We're back, and it's time for From the Trenches. From the Trenches. With Julie Dixon-Jackson. Julio Dixon-Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should do the rest of the podcast in a brogue. Holy, holy. Okay, this week's <laughs> trenches. No, nah, let's not. <laughs> All right. Um, so this week's trench story uh, is a little continuing extravaganza that I had an update for yesterday. And I was going to tell this story a couple weeks ago, but um, we didn't have time. So um, uh, my client, we will call him Orville. Okay. Um, I, I did what I do. And uh, we already, it was easy to find his father who was deceased. And uh, I identified uh, his mother as being one of two women because I'd identified matches to both of their parents. Okay. Um, and so I knew it was one of them. Uh, and I kept kind of waffling back and forth as, as to who it should be. And I'm always, I always want to be careful because, I, I mean, there's a 50-50 chance I'm going to choose the wrong one and then out a secret of the other one. Right, right. Um, but I ended up choosing the one that was the same age as the biological father. I guess that's I just, a good guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes sense, I guess. Anyway, and I was, uh, we wrote a letter, but I kind of had a feeling. And you know, I don't like calling people, but on this day, I kind of had um, a wild hair and uh, thought, let me give her a call. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I called this lovely lady and she answered. She was very um, stoic. I want to say, um, and I told her who I was and I, I said, I'm reaching out for somebody who was born on this date, um, in this hospital, which again would be an immediate, like, Oh, I know, I know who the, what this exactly. is about. If you were, exactly. the, if you were the mother, you would know. <laughs> right. And I said, does that date mean anything to you? And she said, 
Possibly. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? You're going to make possibly? me work for it, aren't you, lady? <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> And I'm like, um, okay, well, I'm I'm going to assume that it's you just because you said that, and I know this is probably a shock. And she was just very quiet, and I said, is the, and I just kept talking to her and, you know, telling her this is, please don't feel threatened, and, you know, that we can do this at your pace and all this stuff. And she was very quiet, but very, um, she sounded like she was in shock. Yeah, really. sure. But she didn't hang up on me. That's a win right there. Absolutely. Not being hung up on is always a win. Um, And so I said, you know what? I'm going to, we have both written a letter to you. May I send it to you? And I will give you my contact information in the letter and I'll give you time to process and, you know, we'll just, and, uh, and maybe we'll do a follow up in a few weeks. How is that? And she said, okay, let's do that. So. Okay. So at least I had the answer then. And I was able to call the client immediately and tell him the whole story is like, she, she admitted it right there. I'm like, yep. (laughs) So, so I sent the letter and I usually include one or two pictures and I write a cover letter and I have the client write a letter and I give contact information. And with him, we just gave a phone number and I gave, you know, and gave her the option of reaching back out to either of us. Um, So a week goes by. And or maybe two weeks, and I hadn't heard anything. So that was when I was going to do my follow up. And I called the client first, and I said, "Just wondering if you've heard from your mother." And he said, "No, have you?" And I said, "No, I would have. I would have told you immediately if I had." And he said, "But something else has happened, though." Oh. <laughs> and I said, "What pray tell might that be?" And he said, "Well, you're not going to believe this, but I was with a coworker of mine. We were." driving and you know we drive long um long lengths and have lots of things that we talk about so I started telling him my story about what's going on and I came up and I told him that uh my mother was this name let's say it's Bjorgi which is my favorite name yes um let's say it's Joan Bjorgi and and the guy said huh Bjorgi I know somebody named Bjorgi and he said, yeah. And he said, yeah, my aunt, I think he said, has been dating a guy by that name uh, for a while. And it was, a, it was an even more unusual name than Bjorgi. Um, so, you know, it kind of jumps out at you if you know one of those people right. in, in your life. So he's like, I'm going to call him right now. So he call, gets the guy on the line. Long story short, it's my client's half-brother. That's nuts. Yeah. I mean, what are the odds, really? You know, people in this situation, in our situation, we seem to experience coincidence and happenstance more often. So let me ask you this. Did his birth mother that you had contacted, was she very far um, from where he, your client is? No. No. So they, so, you know, it's not that yeah, much. Yeah, they're all, they're in the same state still. Okay. Yeah, but yes. even with that. I know. Well, and the name, and granted, if had he known the name, he may have found her himself earlier because the name is what obviously right. was stopping him from finding her. Um, and that's what, that's, what, that's what I was there for. Oh my so, uh, you know, they end up talking. The guy has never heard, have, has, has never heard this. That, and by the way, the guy is a year and a month old older than him. So he, it's his older half-brother. And he um, grew up with the birth mother. He was not yes. put up for adoption. He was not, but he was born before she was married to her, the husband that he had, she had two other kids with later. I see. So he was, he, th- that guy's an NPE. Wow. Um, and so he invited him over to his house. And they spent the entire day together and discovered all of these things they have in common and really connected. And he has a new brother that That, they literally go to car shows together. That's amazing. (laughs) Now, did this brother, this new brother, tell his mother, contact your son, contact my brother? No, no, he did not. (sighs) Um, And he said, this is going to be really hard for her. 
She's a very set in her ways. She is very, uh, she's kind of a pretty, as I said, I I said stoic. And that's the way he described her as well. But uh, they kind of are waiting for her to tell them. Mm. So I was like, and this was what, two or three weeks ago. And I said, well, that's amazing. Um, Please keep me posted. I would love to hear how this turns out. I'm just surprised he didn't go to his mother right away. You know, like, Mom. This well, look at- he knows his... Well, and, and here's the thing. There's the added extra of... Um, he was born out of wedlock as well, but he was kept. Right, right. And so... And maybe that's why the mother is so freaking out, because she's scared he won't... He will find out that, you know, one was good enough to keep and one wasn't. Mm. Right, um, yeah. So... Fast forward to yesterday, my phone rings, and it's, uh, what did I say her name was? Margaret Bjorgi? Let's say it's Margaret Bjorgi now. No, I said Joan. Joan Bjorgi. I don't remember, um, but I, I remember the Bjorgi. Yeah, so always. You Because every one Bjorgi. of your clients' his last name is Bjorgi. It's, it's my go-to <laughs> name. Someday you're going to get like a real Bjorgi calling you looking for uh, help, and you're going to have to change, and it. you're going to have to change the name on this podcast. To Jones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if I use a different name, you'll know it must be Bjorki. Exactly. Um, so it's this lady, and she's like, it's me. And now I know that the brothers are in contact with yes, each other. going to car shows together. Yes, but I don't know what she knows, so I just let her talk. And I said, so you got my letter? And she said, yeah, I've been waiting to call you back. And I'm like, so have you spoken to to your son and she's like no can't bring myself to do it mm. and she goes and you know what i'm really afraid of my other my other kids knowing oh. and i'm like well i'm not going to contact your other kids just you know so you know that but there's a, a the dna is out there and if any of them are one of their offspring tests or a close relative of yours which is how i found you right you know, it's gonna get out. Right. There are no I more just, secrets. Yes. yes. Th- right. There are no more secrets. I'm just, and this, that's not a threat. I'm just, I, I need for you to know where you stand. Did you tell her the truth was in her genes? <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I should have said, and the truth is in your genes. <laughs> click. And then, click. <laughs> and then my song started to play <laughs> the jingle. It was a musical moment. Um, So, but then, and I kept, and I almost said, you know, (laughs) they already know, right? right? You do know that, right? But I didn't. No, it's not your place to tell, yeah. I know. But, and I did tell her that you might be surprised that it wouldn't be such a shock. No, I mean, it is a little a bit of a moral quandary because you could have sort of eased your conscience in a way by saying, well, you're, yes. you're, one of your sons already knows. But right. yeah, it's not your right. place, I know. Right. So we, so, and she also said that she had bought the book, The Girls Who Went Away, that I recommended, which is really amazing. Yeah. That she actually took my advice. Um, and she said she was trying to read it. And I also mentioned that because she said she has never told another single soul hmm. about this, uh, which hurts my heart. Sure. And it's, a, it's um, a tough secret to hold all those years. Yes, yeah. yes, it just messes with you. I bet. Um, and I said, "Have you ever been in therapy?" I don't. You know, I, this might be the time. And she goes, "I've never thought about it, but since you called, I've been thinking about it." Hmm. So I'm like, "Okay, that's." These are all good responses. Yes. Um, so, you know, and I said, well, you know what? I'll just thank you for calling me. I appreciate you calling me, keeping me in the loop. Um, I actually didn't expect it. Um, but if if you would like to talk to me, if you're having more questions for me, please feel free to call me. And um, Did she know that you were going to tell her uh, birth son that, 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 that you had spoken? I don't know, but I'm assuming she did. Right. I mean, I, I will assume she did because, you're uh, because working that's for the exactly client. what I did. Well, of course. I, I mean, of course. Yeah. yeah. So I called him and I told him, he's like, that's amazing <laughs> because she still doesn't know. The other brother doesn't want to tell her. And the other brother hasn't told the other siblings either. Right. So they have their own little secret brother club. <laughs> um, and everybody else is in the dark. You know, the first rule about secret brother club. Nobody talks about Secret Brother Don't Club. Don't talk about Secret Brother Club. <laughs> <laughs> something 
about a bar of soap. <laughs> Something. I don't know. So, I mean, is it... Um, I, I would assume then that your client could go to his uh, half-brother and say, she reached out to, you know, my Jen Genie, yes. and I think mm-hmm. this would be a good time for you to tell her that we have connected. Um, y- yes, but I think what he's going to do is write her a letter. Um, she's kind of a Luddite, and so, and he said he regrets not putting his address in uh, the original letter, just a phone number, mm. because she probably... Um, communicates better in writing. I see. Yeah. So he's going to actually send her a snail mail letter, I think, and maybe give a little more information. And the th- there, the coincidence is what he's discovered um, uh, w- within the whole family. I, I talked about the car show, and both the boys go to car show and collect um, boys and collect classic cars, but the mother does too. And apparently she runs marathons. The woman's in her 80s. God love her. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I want to meet her. So uh, that is the crazy from the trenches story. And uh, I don't think the, there's anything um, normal about any of the trenches stories. No. Oh, well, every one of them is unique because everybody's story, as, including like every interview you do with all of these people who are, who are um, right. nice enough to share and generous mm-hmm. enough to share the, their stories. They're all so unique. And that because of their how unique they are, we, we can all relate to them because we find something to relate. It's incredible, right? Yes, yes. And it also, I think it validates everybody's experience too. For sure, for sure. And also it proves that there's no predicting anything. No, you know what it does, Julie, is, is it <laughs> validates our common humanity, you know, because yes. I can relate to this stuff and I am not uh, an adoptee. Yeah. Also, I... Empathize, so <laughs> so that yes. helps. <laughs> you're just a, you're just a, you're just a big old ball of empathy. But I would just imagine, <laughs> though, you know that people. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's our common humanity that binds us, and I think though if we all remembered that, we'd be a lot mm-hmm. better off. Good point. On that note, let's take a break. Let's go out <laughs> while I said something smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans with Julie Dixon Jackson and Richard Castle. You can support us by going to patreon.com forward slash cutoff jeans podcast. Now back to the program. All right, we're back and it is time for part two of BK Jackson of severancemag.com's Epic Odyssey. Can you remind us where we left, uh, where we left off last time? No. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So, <laughs> so um, you know what? To tell you the truth, I, I, she told us uh, a great story about her NPE status um, and her helping her siblings, uh, and left off with basically that was the prequel. Now, what I'm about to tell you is the sequel. So, there's something ha- happened after that, but I can't tell you exactly what that was. Oh, let's let's listen in and find out. <laughs> All right. But it took almost well more than a year and a half to find mine. Mm. And when I did, it turned out he died 17 years earlier. <sighs> so I didn't get to meet him, but I did get to find lots of cousins. Okay. Um, so those are the prequels in the story, which I guess it makes this last thing. I'll tell you something of the sequel. Okay. Um, I'd given up trying to find that sister who had been adopted. Um, by that point, I figured it was impossible for someone to be unaware of DNA testing, right? I mean, Ancestry had commercials every two minutes. Yeah. You know, the guy in the leader hose and the whole thing, they yes. were everywhere. Yes. You, you couldn't, you know, you'd have so to live much. under a rock to not know. Yes. Yeah. And to not realize that if you were adopted, you could find it. Technology. Yeah. So I figured there were only three possibilities. She didn't know she was adopted. Mm. She had zero interest in finding her bio- biological family if she knew, mm-hmm. or she was dead. Mm. So I began to let it go, and I accepted that that would always be a mystery. And then nearly two years ago, I got a message from my heritage about a close match. And I'd only recently transferred my DNA to my heritage. It was kind of last on my thinking. Yep. And here's a tip for your listeners that you've no doubt already told them, but if you're looking for family, test everywhere. Yes, test everywhere. Even though ancestry and transfer. Yes. Yeah. It's important. Even though I have never had a decent match on my heritage or I, or 23 and me, frankly, but you know, my relatives are in Australia, so that it's not that much of a surprise. Well, Um, I was, I was surprised actually without testing in all of them, I would never have figured out my puzzle. Most of it came from Ancestry, but one really key piece came from 23andMe. 
There and you go. My sister came from my heritage. There you so go. So I really think people have got to do it. Yep. You know, all of them. Because all if, of them. If, you know, you're looking for the person that's at the front of the building and you're at the back, mm-hmm. you're out of luck. Yep. So, yeah. So if you're serious. Good advice. Everywhere. Um, yeah. Otherwise, it's a comedy of errors. And, mm-hmm. So when I got this match, I wasn't thinking about that sister. I'd so completely given up on her. I thought it must be another one of my mother's whoops. Um, surprises, or maybe a child of my biological father, that was possible too. Yeah. But I quick, I quickly researched her name and she was the right age, born at the right time in the right place. And it was her. Wow. And coincidentally, or, or not, as one of my other sisters might say, it was on the anniversary of my mother's death. This oh, match popped up. That's, and that's, that's gotta be yeah. more than coincidence. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, um, uh, died in the wool skeptic, except so many things have happened. I could tell you some really crazy stories. So many things have happened, but I'm not going to say. Me my, too. my sister used to say to me, yeah. she said, all of this happened because my mother made it happen, directed it from above. Mm-hmm. And I, I, when I first met her, I was like, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. But things have happened, and I can't say that anymore. So I, the, co- the amount of coincidence that happens, uh, oh. you know, for, especially for people like us, it seems. Um, it, it seems to be like otherworldly, like it's like somebody is directing it. I, you know, I don't it, know who or what, it does. but yeah, it does. And I just honestly don't believe in that. And also not just like otherworldly, but all of the, the coincidences and synchronicity, so many things had to happen for me to put all these pieces together. Yeah. I mean, the way I discovered my mother's obituary was such complete acts. I was sitting here with my husband, um, this awful winter day and we were talking we met like a million years ago in venice california and we were talking about this waitress we knew mm-hmm. my husband worked in a restaurant at the time and he said i think i think i know that she's dead and i was like you don't know and he didn't so i went up to the upstairs to the social security index which i know about mm-hmm. and i put her name in and sure enough she had died and then i realized that it was an advanced function and i put in everything i knew about my mother and there she was. And it's like if my husband hadn't mentioned this woman, that wouldn't have happened. All kinds of things wouldn't have happened. Wait, you you put it in the Social Security Index? Yeah. And before, I didn't have a last name for her. You know, she doesn't oh. like using her, her married name or, or her maiden name. And I, I didn't know what to put in. But I realized if you put all of those things plus a birthday plus a birthplace, it came up with it. Well, And you I had her social? Or did you? Or I, did, did. I didn't. I didn't. All I had was her, um, which I don't think it called her. birth date. Her. And I had her birth date, her birthplace, and I put in her middle and her first name. Wow. And only one name came up. I suppose it could have been that other names, but only one came up. So it wow. was her, and I, I had her, yeah. Wow. So if that hadn't happened, I would never know. And if yep. tons of other things hadn't happened, I'd never know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... As you've probably guessed by now, um, the sister that I found, the one my dad signed the papers for adoption, mm. my dad was not her father. Oh, I had not yeah, guessed so. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> Strangely yeah, enough, I I'm still surprised. I hadn't either. I was, I was still a little surprised. <laughs> oh. um, so, yeah, and which leads me, of course, to think that there are tons of... Um, Secrets still out there. Oh, but that's yeah. the nutshell version of, of my story. Um, tell me about the sister, though. That Was she looking for family? Did she know she was adopted? She did know she was adopted. She, Her mother, uh, I don't remember the time period exactly, but her, her adopted mother died in, in maybe a year earlier. And she was mm. one of those people who, you know, so common, she didn't want to upset her mother. Yes, yes. So she didn't look. So yeah. That's she so didn't common. know very much, you know, she had not much information. She, she, her, her, um, her non-identifying information, um, told her some squirrely things. They said that her dad was someone who already had too many kids. It said that her mother was arrested for writing bad checks. <gasps> and that's why she was, which is completely sound. Yeah. Like, well, could have been my mother. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. And but then still they her, made her, they they would just make up stories all the time. Oh yeah. They made up they made up a lot of stuff. They said that my dad lived in New York, you know. It was close enough, but not quite. Yeah. Um, but when she found her birth name, my mother oh, I forgot to tell you, when I was a kid, we had this woman who took care of us when we were kids. She was she I wouldn't call her a nanny because she was like family, mm-hmm. the closest thing to a mother I ever knew. And she told me that that this sister's name was either Alexandra or Alexis. Okay. Um, and she also told me that my mother got in trouble somehow over this adoption. Like she 
intimated that she sold the baby or something. Oh. So, so I already knew there was, you know, likely a, you know, a story. Yeah. So the first thing, one of the first things I, you know, when I, when I discovered my other siblings, I was too bashful to call and we went for like three months mm-hmm. without ever talking. We emailed like crazy. But the mm-hmm. minute I got this message, I called the sister and she said all she knew was her birth name. And I said to her, was it Alexis or Alexandria? And I could hear her gasp. <gasps> She's like, yeah, yeah, it was. And then oh, her middle name crazy. was for my father. So mm-hmm. my mother was trying to make it look as if she was my father's child. Yeah, of course. So that's the story. Wow. Wow, wow, yeah. wow. Um, Crazy. That's amazing. That's, yeah. I, it's just, it, 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 I'm still amazed. I'm in the middle of this, but I'm still amazed every time. Tell me about, uh, obviously I know what inspired Severance Magazine, but <laughs> what became, what was the impetus, I guess, um, uh, for it? And tell me about well, it, too, so for, the, okay. for the people who don't know about it. Okay. Um, I describe it as an online magazine and communi- community for mm-hmm. people with issues, you know, related to gen- genetic identity. And it's for all of them because so much, there's so much we have in common, I think, mm. um, donor conceived people and adoptees, yet we're always sort of separated into all these different Facebook groups and written about separately. And I thought it might be useful to connect us. And, and you know, there are lots of Facebook groups for each of those populations, but mm-hmm. not a lot of crossover, That's although true. that's changing. Yeah, And at the time I had this DNA surprise, I somehow, and I don't remember how I discovered the big group, you know, the big group, um, for, um, DNA and Yes. Folks. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and there wasn't much, I don't, how old is your podcast? Uh, let me see. We started in 20, it's three years old. <laughs> okay. So you so. weren't, you didn't exist then. Yeah. And there were very few resources. There weren't. You know, there were there were resources for adoptees and and maybe a few for donor conceived people, right? But not much. No, no podcast that I knew of, and only a couple of workers. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, you know, and I and I realized through the, you know, joining that group, how common this was, how mm-hmm. crazy common it was. Mm-hmm. And of course, like everyone else, I thought, oh, it was only me. So I was a little surprised. But but I thought there was something more maybe that was needed than a support group. Yeah. Um, and I, I know there's an overlap, but I tend to think people lean into one approach or another, like to be wanting support or wanting information. You know, there are people who want support groups right? and those for, who look for, you know, something maybe a little more expert. Yeah. So I envisioned this as a place that could offer both. Right. And, okay. And there's lots of support groups do well, but I don't think they're enough. And, and I noticed on the downside of, I'm, I'm, you can probably say, I'm not a real support group person. Um, that, I mean, I think they're great for, for people who yes. want to know they're not alone. Right. But it's not not kind of my my thing. Yeah, um, I want the information. But one of the downsides of the group, or for me, there was in 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 the groups was that there's there always seemed to be people who wanted to speak for or represent MP yes. as if we were a monolithic group and could be mm-hmm. spoken for. And I know you know how this works because um, adoptees are always spoken for. Always. Um, so they were talking about us as if we all have the same you know, feelings and the same beliefs and values. Right. And, and, and if it you. doesn't align with theirs, then it's not as valid. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it almost seemed a little, maybe I shouldn't say that. I won't say what I was going to say, but anyway, <laughs> in the groups, people were being given advice, you know, by, about really significant issues, you know, even behavioral health issues, mm, because, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, this can produce trauma. Yes. Some people. And, and one of the things that I sort of found difficult was that people were being told they had to have trauma, which isn't the case. Yeah. Not everybody has trauma. That's a really good point. Um, yeah, no, they don't. And not everybody needs therapy and not everybody needs support groups. But I think most people probably need information about one thing or another. Yep. So I wanted to, to create a place where people could tell their story, maybe get some actual expert um, input. And I'm a journalist. That's my background. And I've created magazines. It's what I do. So it's what came to mind. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of half a magazine where there can be articles that rely on interviews with people who are actual experts about things like rejection and disenfranchised grief and yeah. the psychology, you know, those things that we all think about. And the other half is the community part by which, I mean, that readers can contribute essays and stories. And I think that's really important because, and I know you, well, I'm sure you agree because of what you do, mm-hmm. but storytelling is important. It's powerful. Yes. I think, and that's, I think it gives that is the therapeutic part for me. Yeah, for yeah. you and for the people who hear you and for the people who tell you their stories, right? Yeah, and um, just having a voice. For me, it's important to have a voice because I spent so much time feeling like I wasn't heard 
and wasn't. Yeah. So I, it's like I, I, I can, I'm talking and I can't shut up yeah. <laughs> now. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because it's like people don't talk about this being a. Um, when when I said that people don't necessarily have trauma, I do think that everybody has grief related to this. Yeah. And yes, a fact of grief is it needs to be spoken. People need to speak their grief. And when when you lose a person, you talk about them over and over and over. Mm-hmm. And that's part of what people I think need to do here. And it's why so many people want to talk to you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's it's healing. I imagine it's healing for you, and it's healing for the people who are listening. Um, and the people who are talking. So I think storytelling is really, really important. Yeah. So that's why I created it. Um, I didn't mean to do this. I meant to maybe start a blog. I just, when I do something, I just go overboard and it got carried away. (laughs) It's great though. It's great. (laughs) It's just, there's always a new essay or, uh, or, or a post that, that just is, looking at something from a different way or something that we haven't thought of and or or just information that is uh so beautifully written about i i think right. that's one right. of the differences too is that you you really have um uh great contributors along with yourself obviously i i appreciate that and people you know people sometimes say oh i want to tell my story but i'm not not a writer and i tell them you don't have to be a writer to tell your story. Yeah. You really don't. Yeah. Um, just like people don't have to be writers to tell you their story. Right. Right. Um, but it, it's, it's been a little difficult to keep up with, but I'm, I'm glad I started it and people seem to like it. So. Yeah. It's great. So um, tell, uh, tell, tell us how, tell the listeners how they can find it. Oh, it's at um, severancemag.com and it's also on social media at severancemag.com and Despite what I said about support groups, I have one for this group, but I don't think of it as a support group. I think of it as a place mm-hmm. to share information. And a lot of the groups don't allow people to share resources, and I really invite it. I want Yeah, you, know, you do. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I want everybody, whatever they have going, that might help somebody else have right. to tell it. So yeah. that, that's called Adoptees, MPEs, <laughs> Donor Conceived, and Other Identity. Other genetic identity seekers. I know I couldn't have made it more difficult. Yeah, it's pretty it. wordy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the easiest way to find it is if people go to the homepage of sevenspank.com on the right side. There's a little box they can click. <laughs> so there are lots and lots of resources that are there available for MPs and adoptees and everyone. Um, and I've got big resource sections on the site and on the sidebar of the website, you can click on some of these. But there are nonprofits like Right to Know, which is doing a lot of work on fertility fraud and all kinds yeah. of things. And there are search angels like DNA Angels and the Watershed DNA, mm-hmm. which also has a new podcast. Yes. And We Are Donor Conceived, um, which also has a new magazine and books and articles and all that. So you can find that all on my website. And um, yeah, That's it's great. growing. Yeah, it's really it's it's really a wonderful thing, and I'm and I'm happy to have been able to participate in it, and always send people over there too. Yeah, um, and same in reverse. Yeah, um, BK, thank you so much for thank telling you. your story. I'm I'm so glad to to know your story now, and uh, to have an opportunity for yeah. everybody else to hear it, and to know, mm-hmm. and for people to know about Severance Magazine, which I love. And thank you, um, thank thank you for you. taking a little time out of your Sunday <laughs> now that we finally oh, got there. And I, and I really appreciate what you do. I think it's just a huge thing. So thank you for Well, that. vice versa. The feeling is mutual. All right. Thank you so much, BK, for taking the time to talk to me and um, trusting me with your story and agreeing. And BK says she's very shy uh, and she's not doesn't like talking. <laughs> <laughs> but I think she did terrific. It was a great story. And BK, thank you so much for sharing it with all of us. And thank you so much for Severance Magazine. They are There are always interesting essays, insightful articles. Um, and uh, I, I truly appreciate uh, the presence of Severance Magazine. Julie, we've reached the end of season three of our podcast. Oh my gosh. Because this is Can episode 312. And we decided after the first hundred episodes that we were... <laughs> In the first season, right. that we were going to do 12 per season. And right, this is- we went 100, 12, 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We really did a U-turn there. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's always a pleasure. And we will be back with everybody at the beginning of June. We'll take a short little break. 
And in the meantime, I'm going to go back and start playing piano, and you can find Yay! out all about that at my website, richardcastle.com, or you can follow me on the Twitter, at Castle Songs, or Instagram, at Castle Songs as well. So I'm Julie Dixon Jackson. Find me on the Twitter at Jules Jackson with two O's. Find the podcast at Cutoff Jeans Pod. Uh, find us on Facebook, Cutoff Jeans Podcast. Uh, join the conversation. It's a heck of a lot of fun. And send me an email if you would like to hire me, if you'd like to ask a question, if you would like me to do an analysis at Jules Jackson at CutoffJeans.com. And as always, the truth is in your jeans. Mm-hmm.